swine it. It's time for a new era of communication in the swine industry, one that you can get the latest updates while you're commuting or driving to farms. Here you have the brightest minds of the global swine industry in your pocket. In a stall barn, typically we don't know where those gilts versus older sows are going to be located, so we feed a common diet, which commonly over over uh, formulates those uh, nutrients for the older sows who are done growing and just needing maintenance and the development of the of the growing fetus. Welcome to Swine Eat Podcast. My name is Marcel Gonçalves, your host for today's episode. Swine Eat Podcast is only possible with the support of forward-looking and innovative companies like Gestal, always one step ahead in swine feeding, Every Pig, a simple yet powerful pig health and production management tool, NutriQuest, experts serving producers delivering breakthrough solutions, and Zimpro, essential trace minerals, exceptional performance. This episode's sponsor highlight is about Gestal. Celebrating its 25th anniversary, Gestal manufactures the original wireless standalone swine feeding system. Designed by pork producers, for pork producers, they are simple, reliable and provide peace of mind 24-7, 365 days a year. Gestal is not just manufactured by an equipment company, but by a family pork production business with a slat level understanding. Gestal, always one step ahead in swine feeding. Hello everyone, today we have Dr. Hyatt Frobos, uh, and he's going to talk about designing the modern sow farm from a nutritionist perspective. How are you today, Hyatt? I'm good. Thank you for having me, Marcio. I appreciate you you being here with us. And uh, uh, just as always, uh, tell us about yourself. Yeah, well, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to share some thoughts with you guys today. And uh, quick background, I'm originally a native of Northwest Ohio, and I migrated to the Midwest uh, when I went to Kansas State University and completed my master's and PhD in swine nutrition there, which is where Marcio and I first met up. My focus mm -hmm. uh, throughout my graduate career, as well as now in my job with Gestalt, focused on sows, feeding a modern sow. And uh, it really all started for me with my first internship was with uh, Dan Bread, now DNA, up in Nebraska. And I think uh, I got put on the night shift production internship as we were looking at the impact of feeding sows three times a day instead of two times a day by hand and feeding at night versus during the day. And this was uh, a good job for an intern during the summer of my junior year in college, but it got me, I guess, uh, acquainted with some of the challenges with feeding sows and in, in lactation and gestation. And I guess got me a little bit hooked on the challenges and opportunities that exist in sow research and in maximizing productivity in sows and, That's what led to some of my follow-up work in my graduate degree, uh, looking at feeding lactating sows. And I spent a year in Australia on a Fulbright scholarship and, and came back from that to start my PhD looking at stimulating estrus and lactating sows, which involved some fairly creative ways of feeding and managing sows in the farrowing crate. So that background uh, really set the foundation for me as I transitioned into my role with Gestal where I started in 2015 as their nutritionist for their global team, as well as the U.S. business manager. And since that time, I've been heavily involved in working with mm -hmm. Gestal customers on pen gestation, housing and design, as well as feeding their lactating sows, electronic sow feeders. And more recently, working on research barn design and GDUs. And so working in this technology space, as well as uh, working in the building design space has given me kind of a unique perspective, which is, uh, I think, a, a good subject for the discussion today, as I've been a nutritionist that's gotten involved in building design and strategies relating to infrastructure. As I've found in a lot of the retrofit facilities and, and building facilities, a lot of the known nutritional opportunities that we may know 
physiologically make sense have been hard to execute due to limitations in barn design. And so I wanted to spend some time with Marcio and, and the audience today going over some of the things that I've come across in my experience uh, living on both the building and uh, design standpoint, as well as the traditional nutritionist perspective. This is great. Thanks, uh, Hyatt, for the for that uh, introduction there. And and yeah, I mean, not many nutritionists are, are involved in design, and and so that's going to be be great. Uh, and then also balancing right the performance, the economics, the science. What is ideal from a biological standpoint? What can we implement? So, so I look forward to to the discussion. Yeah, um, w one point that I guess has been interesting to me, and, and I especially see this with a lot of our larger systems in the U.S. today. We have talented people that are, are focused on specific areas. Obviously, a production nutritionist would be one of those, but often those same uh, companies have counterparts that work in the building design or capital investment type of the equation. And I feel sometimes one of the downsides of, of larger systems is that everybody can sometimes get trapped in their silos of, of knowledge. And uh, this can be a, a limiting factor for us sometimes because I will bring some questions to the conversation uh, with those who are building the design for the new South Arm. And you can tell that they haven't thought about it from a nutritionist perspective. And although we're all busy people and we know that uh, there's, there's only so much time in the day, I think including the nutritionist in you know, having a set of eyes on new building layouts is important to understand what can we do from a feed system design approach to execute some of those known opportunities in terms of sound nutrition. And that's, uh, that's I guess, where... I want to dive a little deeper on some of the things that we talk about today, Marcio. Very nice. Sounds good. So let's uh, let's think through the production cycle of the sow and and start off with a GDU and and your thoughts there, Hyatt. Yeah, well, I, I think the GDU design could be a topic for a completely different uh, podcast as well. And so I'm I'm going to maybe just touch the surface and allow us to dive a little deeper on the sow side because that's really my bread and butter. But mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of comments from nutritionists and production people lamenting the fact that we struggle to get gilts fed right in the growing stages before they enter the sow farm. And I think it's, right. it's pretty clear that we have a high turnover rate in our sow herd. And it's interesting to me that although we average over 50% annual replacement rate in our herds, you know, Canada, for example, one country to the north, is averaging a replacement rate around 45%. So it shows that there's some opportunity to improve some things in terms of sow longevity. And I, I think a lot of that starts with GDU design. Where I, I guess I really get frustrated is the fact that I don't see a lot of innovation in GDU design. Uh, and they often get left as an afterthought in the building equation. Even though we know that those females are the next generation and there's a lot of value in getting them fed right to have a higher selection rate and maybe a higher retention rate after they enter the herd. Because one of the most concerning things to me is the number of animals that leave the herd before they reach their second parity. I don't think nutrition is the only part of that equation. Obviously, stocking density and genetics and reproductive factors are all really important traits. But it does concern me that many GDUs, especially smaller to medium size on-site GDUs, struggle to get gilts phase-fed properly and oftentimes aren't feeding them additional nutrients that might be needed for a developing female, such as supplemental vitamins, trace minerals. So I think there's definitely an opportunity in GDU space to rethink our design equation. Um, in particular, body condition management is a challenge area that many people comment struggling to keep gilts lean enough while growing properly to enter the herd with the right type of uh, reproductive status. That being said, uh, finding a way to get them growing but not too fat as they enter the herd is important because it's well known that gilts that get too fat too early have Limit, uh, it affects their lifetime memory development and milking capacity. 
And uh, we all know the consequences of animals that are too fat in gestation on their stillborn rates and lactation feed intake post farrowing. So I don't have a panacea on, on the GDU design, but I, it does concern me when we have GDUs that are designed and implemented poorer than even finishing gilts or finishing pigs. I think it's important that we get them phase fed properly. And if it's deemed appropriate to add supplemental vitamins and trace minerals, I think we need to get that into them at the right time. That being said, the body condition side of the equation is challenging because simply increasing fiber in the diet doesn't seem to be a quick fix either since the gilts can compensate and just have higher intake. So I think there's still some opportunities out there for people with innovative minds or, or new technologies to find ways to keep those gilts growing without necessarily over conditioning the higher intake animals in a pen. Yeah, that makes total sense, Hayat. Uh, one thing that I would add as well is just a call for guild development research. It feels like we have more boar research than guilds. I don't know if that's something you, you, you would agree. Yeah, I'd agree with that because I, I do get asked a lot to help with GDU design, whether it's involved in just all equipment or not. And I struggle sometimes to find a strong case within the literature to apply specific feeding methods or strategies. So we're oftentimes reverting back to experience and, and large scale data that maybe isn't backed up in science as, as robustly as I'd like to. So with, with more of a foundation that would allow me at the execution stage to be able to back up recommendations with science more effectively. Very nice. Cool. So let's, transition into gestation feeding higher what what are your thoughts there yeah so uh i've had the opportunity to work with quite a few sow farms in my four years with gestall in their transition to pen housing and with that transition to pen housing it, it creates some opportunities to have some conversations about how we're going to modify the feeding strategies for these sows and and different uh, farms are at different points as far as how progressive or or futuristic they want to be in, in terms of feeding strategies. But I, but I think at the very least, uh, we, we open the door for some opportunities when we convert to group housing to implement some known opportunities that we haven't done historically in a 100% gestation stall barn system. Probably the best example of this would be the opportunity to feed parity specific diets. And uh, while you could get down in the weeds and, and get more specific beyond this, I think a very attainable goal and one that would accomplish a lot in terms of feeding the sows to their nutritional requirements and, and economically having a payback would be splitting your sow herd in half and feeding the younger animals. So let's say gilts and P1s representing approximately 50% of your herd a separate diet from your P2 plus animals who genu who generally are going to have a lower amino acid as well as low lower calcium and phosphorus requirements. In a stall barn, typically we don't know where those gilts versus older sows are going to be located. So we feed a common diet, which commonly over, over uh, formulates those uh, nutrients for the older sows who are done growing and just needing maintenance and the development of their of the of the mammary tissue or de development of uh, of the growing fetus so with pen gr group housing for example there's a lot of data from a behavior and welfare standpoint that we can minimize aggression and improve reproductive outcomes by parity segregating animals so we already should be grouping animals young and old in group housing So to me, it's just one more extension of what we should already be doing to design a sow barn to have a separate feed system for those pens that are geared towards young animals to feed them a higher lysine, higher calcium and phosphorus diet relative to the older sow pens. And, you know, depending on your costs in your area and what nutrient levels you're, you're willing to hang your hat on for those, 
I think it's going to vary a little bit about what that economic payback is, but just using some 2018 numbers that I had, I had put together for some models for customers, I was seeing a payback of around $2 to 250 us per inventoried female by feeding parity segregated diets. And so if you think about the, nice. the added cost of a couple more bins and another chain disc unit, you can pay back those extra infrastructure related costs within a couple years, uh, regardless of feed costs. And especially as we look to this year where we're looking to have a little higher input costs, it's certainly worth, worth putting a pencil to some of these opportunities uh, as you think about barn design on the front side. Very good. Yeah, that's, that's quite a bit of a fairly quick uh, payback. Any other thoughts in gestation, Hyatt? Yeah. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the other byproducts of moving to a pen gestation type of scenario is that we, by proxy, get the later, mid to late gestation animals in a separate area of the barn from the early gestation animals. Most U.S. farms converting to group housing are, are keeping sows in stalls through preg check. So somewhere around 35 to 42 days is the most common. By having those sows in stalls and the vast majority of the animals that are in stalls being in early gestation, this does create some opportunities to consider feeding a dedicated early gestation diet. There probably needs to be some more research in this area to validate some of the early work that's been done, but there are some feed additives that have been shown internationally to show some benefits in terms of pregnancy rates, as well as ovulation rates and, and uh, embryo survival. And while those feed additives may or may not have uh, the economic payback if you had to feed them throughout gestation, by having a captive group of animals in early gestation, it allows you to focus an added cost of a feed additive into those first trimester pregnancy animals that are in stalls. So I think there's some opportunity to dive a little deeper on feed additives for early gestation uh, because with most new farms using some form of group housing, we have the ability to dial to, to dial down that diet for the sows in stalls as one that's primarily for those in early gestation. Very good. Um, as you walk through farms, Hayata, any general comments on body condition management and, and those, those areas? Definitely. Uh, in, in gestation, whether it's stalls or pens, I think this continues to be an area that you know, really goes back to execution. And I see some farms that do a, a better job than others and some with varying levels of technology that is used more or less effectively. But body condition management remains a challenge, especially when we get into labor issues. Uh, calibrating your box drops in stalls or in stanchion pens is something that often is done wrong. I, I, I remember Wayne Cass telling me one time that uh, he thought one of the worst things that was done was putting numbers on the box drops. And they thought they should be letters because it's all tied back to bulk <laughs> density and not, not an actual uh, weight inside those boxes. And I think that was a very accurate view because I see a lot of challenges in getting those box drops adjusted just because it's a, a labor, a labor driven task. And we're, we're short on labor in most of our sow farms today. So we need to make it easy with, uh, with different types of electronic sow feeders. Uh, I, I definitely give my customers tips on how to minimize the amount of adjustments they have to make. Uh, you can, you can assign sows to a body condition curve when they enter the pens, but you can assume that they come back into the right body condition if they get fed a, 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 a fat diet or a skinny diet for a certain number of days. One thing that I've son, mm -hmm. seen done wrong is uh, if, you, if you assign a, a sow to a, a thin body condition curve when they enter the pens mm -hmm. at, say, day 35, if you feed her a thin diet, which might give her five or six pounds instead of the routine four or four and a half pounds, if you feed her that for 70 days, she often becomes a fat sow and, and kind of, uh, you know, you lose the, lose the opportunity that you, that you had by, by getting those sows fed better. So designing your feed curves with electronic sow feeders the right way is something that can really optimize your feed use and prevent that roller coaster effect of thin sows becoming fat and fat sows becoming thin. 
But the same thing can happen in, in, in more rudimentary systems where we end up overfeeding the group to try to, to manage the thin sows in the pen. And ultimately that, that ends up just giving you bigger sows that have a higher maintenance requirements because we end up just increasing the, the mature body size of your sows. And that probably goes all the way back to, to the GDU, Marcio, where you, we overfeed them to keep them growing and we end up making gilts that are a little bigger framed and have a higher body mass than maybe they need to. Uh, and that has a, a recurring cost in just their daily maintenance requirements. Well said. Any other comments before we move to the transition style, Hayan? I just say that on the body condition side, I have seen more and more people utilizing objective measurements like the sow caliper or, or flank t uh, measurement tapes. Uh, some do back fat, although I, I see that being done better on really high performing farms. Whereas where we're struggling on labor, it's hard to get an accurate back fat and, and do it routinely. So uh, having a simple but objective measurement tool is definitely better than eyeballing it because we have so many different subjective visuals for different workers on the farm and different managers. So having some type of an objective measurement tool is definitely a, a recommendation of mine to minimize uh, unnecessary adjustments or inaccurate adjustments. Very nice. I feel that the caliper got a lot of traction uh, in the U.S. as well as in other countries. Definitely. Good. All right. So... Feeding the transition sow hyats, what are your thoughts? Yeah, this has definitely been an area that I think is gaining a little more attention and traction. And I, I think some of it uh, is rooted in science because we really, in, in a lactating sow and gestating sow, we're really not that far removed from a dairy cow. And, and the dairy nutritionists have been applying transition diets for a long time. And I think it was only a matter of time until we started looking at what they're doing and seeing whether we can capture any of those same benefits. Um, that being said, I, I think there's still a lot of opportunity for more research in this area. And I'm probably not the best one to go into depth on different uh, nutrients or, or uh, strategies from the, from the ingredient and formulation side, but I've seen more and more people that are talking about transition diet strategies that include supplemental fiber added micronutrients such, such as choline, carnitine, citric acid, or B vitamins, uh, and still see some people that are talking about dietary electrolyte balance. Uh, but I think from a feeding strategy standpoint, that's something that I can comment on further. Uh, and just like in humans, I believe, and it's pretty clear dating back to some data from the 90s from Boss Kemp, that sows, just like pregnant pregnant humans can get gestational diabetes and this can really uh, cause them to have difficulty with glucose tolerance. And I think the subpopulation of sows that we see really struggle around the periparturient period. Uh, some of those that might get attributed with that crash after they farrow or, or MMA related to mastitis, metritis and agalactia um, might be related to some of the differences in glucose tolerance among sows that those who get gestational diabetes and that don't. Uh, a really interesting study that was done by Peter Thiel at Aarhus University uh, in 2017, uh, they, they looked at the frequency of meals that were fed prior to farrowing and the impact on their post-farrowing performance and farrowing performance And they found that sows that ate a meal closer to the time of the onset of farrowing were more likely to complete farrowing more quickly and reduce the number of stillborns they had. So that was something that I thought was a, an interesting study, and it, and it showed that maybe there is some upside to feeding these sows at six-hour intervals or eight-hour intervals. And, and the recommendation that the authors had from that study was feed sows at least three times a day pre farrow uh, But tying that together with feed allowance pre farrow which is one of the things that I see a huge amount of variation among my customers in the U.S. and globally, there appears to be some very long-held beliefs, um, very similar to what we had with bump feeding not very many years ago, Marcio, and you and I have had conversations in the past about bump feeding, and I think uh, the research has, has helped Right. move that conversation forward. But pre-farrowing feed allowance seems to be an area that 
there is people that I work with that want to feed as, as little as three or four pounds pre ferro to those who want to feed full feeding pre ferro And I would mm-hmm. say that although there is some decent data out there, the data that is out there hasn't moved the, the decision of those who view it differently. Uh, and, and I think it's an interesting area that needs a little bit more emphasis placed on it from the nutritional community because it's something that we can manage and manipulate, but if if we're overfeeding them unnecessarily pre ferro, there's a cost to doing that, and it may exasper- exacerbate issues with overconditioned sows. But simultaneously, if we're underfeeding those sows pre ferro and we're uh, causing problems related to constipation or gestational diabetes, uh, I, I think we need to dive a little deeper on pre ferro and feed allowance. And, and make sure we, we have a, a uniform uh, set of recommendations across the nutritional community. Interesting. Yes, uh, um, I'd say that from the data I've seen that, you know, full feeding for a couple of days is probably fine. But then if for some people in, in some countries that uh, transfer the cells more than five days prior to ferrying, that's, you know, that's where we can start having problems I agree, and, and I definitely have batch farrowing customers who maybe need to implement that differently than those who farrow weekly and will load the rooms pretty close to the time of farrowing. Uh, that being said, you know, uh, I, I have I have one customer I can think of that that he's convinced that on the day of farrowing the sow should receive zero feed and should be focused on on the farrowing process, and and he has outstanding performance. So. I, I will definitely say there's there's some devils in the details there that uh, right. I, I don't know that there's a one size fits all approach, but I can say that there's definitely some deep rooted beliefs that different producers and production systems have that there's not a there's not a consensus among the production systems I've worked with in the U.S. or globally, and and maybe that that indicates that we need to dive a little deeper in the research in that area. That makes sense. Good. So let's jump into lactation. Hayat, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, well, uh, the one that jumps out to me on lactation that I think is a is a missed opportunity thus far is I see outside of the U.S. more and more production systems that are implementing parity segregated feeding and lactation. And just like the conversation we had in gestation, there's some known opportunities in getting those P1s and uh, and gilts fed a higher nutrient density diet because we know they're intake limited in lactation, but yet still have some of the same productivity capabilities as an older sow. And so I've seen people add a, 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 a separate feed line that feeds a, a portion of each farrowing room, uh, a different diet so they can get a, a, a specific diet to gilt crates. That seems to be a, a relatively simplistic way of, of getting it fed all the way up to some research that's going on right now with the customers using some of our feeders to blend a high and low amino acid diet at different stages of lactation to best match the nutrient requirements of the sow per day of lactation. And I think it's still early days on that, but we definitely know that the nutrient requirements of the sow vary wildly from early gestation to mid gestation to the last week of, sorry, early lactation to second week of lactation and third week of lactation. And yet we routinely feed a common lactation diet throughout, uh, throughout a sow's uh, farrowing period. So it's interesting to me to, to start getting some data back and, and look at the benefits of keeping sows from going into a catabolic state and as much as anything, just feed savings. Because when we form a basal diet across the entire herd, we're generally formulating that to closer to the gilt or P1's requirements at peak lactation. And what ends up happening is we overformulate the diet for a lot of the days of a sow's lactation uh, period. So there's some major diet savings that we could capture. Uh, Some of the early uh, data that we have indicates that there's times in in a multi-para sow's lactation that because she's eating so much feed, she really may only need a a 0.75 to 0.8 lysine diet. And, and that's obviously quite a bit lower than what we routinely feed as a, as a basal diet. Well, one of the other areas that to me is, a, is a, an opportunity for U.S. sow herds is 
outside of the U.S., I see more people successfully implement wet dry feeding and lactation. And we've embraced wet dry feeding and, and grow finish in the U.S. And the benefits in terms of feed intake are well known there. The data is pretty conclusive on the lactation side, too, that you can see a, a bump in around 7 to 10 percent in feed intake with lactating sows that are fed wet dry. But the, the hesitation that, that always is, is shared in, in the U.S. Is, is how to manage the hygiene of the feed bowl with, with wet dry feeding and lactation. And I think that's a legitimate concern, but not an insurmountable one if you design your feed system the right way or, or capitalize on some automated feeders that can minimize feed waste. But the, the benefits to wet dry and lactation are, are definitely there if you can successfully implement it. And we're, we're always struggling to get more intake into these sows and a 7 to 10 percent bump in feed intake is definitely something that we don't want to ignore if the opportunity is there. Right. Any other general comment in design or feeding, Hyatt, before we jump into our three questions? Yeah, la just the last thing I would say in lactation is that it, just like the fact that we've moved the needle forward on bump feeding in gestation, I still see a lot of variation uh, within independence and larger scale systems relating to the amount of feed post farrow. And I, I think it's pretty clear in the literature and And from the research that's been done that we should be giving these sows, you know, close to, if not full feed allowance in early, just early lactation. And uh, that being said, it's not always being done on farm today. And that shows that maybe that isn't trickling down from the production manager or nutritionist level to the actual execution steps in the barn. And so uh, I think there's still an opportunity for us to, to have a louder voice there and, uh, Make sure that we're getting these sows on full feed immediately post farrowing. Makes sense. Full feeding, fresh feed, and ready to roll. Good deal. NutriQuest delivers targeted breakthrough solutions to animal producers via nutritional and non nutritional products, services, and technologies. At NutriQuest, we believe in ingenuity inspired by servitude and that our success comes from helping producers realize improved profitability through optimized technologies and efficient operation. It is time to our famous three. All right, Hayat, so the three questions we ask every guest every episode. What is your favorite swine-related book? Yeah, so... Uh... I appreciate you asking, and probably the one that's been the most useful for me may not come as a surprise to many, but the the book by Chantel Farmer on the gestating and lactating sow is is a reference material that I like and use regularly. Uh, that's that's probably my favorite one, especially with the amount of sow work that I do. It's a it's a great reference and resource. Good book. And what is your favorite book unrelated to pigs? Yeah, this one was a little tougher for me. I, I'm I'm an avid reader. I do listen to probably as many audiobooks as anything because of the amount of time I spend on the road. But probably the one that I guess would be the most uh, interesting to to anyone is a book called Born to Run by Christopher McDougall. And uh, it's definitely a, a motivational book, but one that's backed up by a, some pretty interesting historical stories. And so it's a it's a great read, but also a, a dynamic one that's not uh, not a lecture based book. Interesting. I think I think that one is in my list. I haven't haven't gotten that one. Very nice. All right. The last one is what separates successful swine professionals from those that are not? Yeah, I think this is a, a tough question, but you know, from from my experience as I've entered the, the workforce, I think one of the, the things that separates those of us that uh are having success is just a uh, real slat level knowledge of the production system, uh, being able to understand production flow and numbers as well as tying that together with, with nutrition. Uh, that's what's, what's maybe helped me be successful and just combining that with a good work ethic. And that's something that, that I, I tell people that to get a PhD, you, you may or may not be really smart, but it definitely shows that you've been willing to put the work in 
And I think in this day and age, uh, we sometimes struggle to find workers that are willing to put in the type of work ethic needed to be successful. And, and that's something that uh, I've been blessed with. And, and it's been an opportunity for me to, to, to leverage that to be successful. So work ethic is definitely something that I'm trying to infuse in my daughter as, uh, as she grows up. Very nice. This is this is great. You put her to work on the cattle yet? Or? Oh yeah, yeah. We went to mm -hmm. we went to the lake this uh, weekend, and she found a couple of buckets and filled them up with water, and she was carrying around two buckets the whole time. So I guess uh, nice. We get away from the farm, and she still wants to carry buckets. So I'd say that's a good sign for her work <laughs> ethic. That's cool. Awesome, hi. Well, appreciate your time and and uh, share your knowledge and experience with us today. Oh, I appreciate it too. I, I uh, get the opportunity to be in a weird spot where I'm involved in building design, but still wearing a nutritionist hat. And sometimes that leads to some interesting conversations.